video is brought to you by Dr. Borai. Please press on the subscribe button and the bell icon. Hello everyone, this is Abhijit Borai. Uh, in this uh, tutorial, we are going to talk about uh, Takutsubo cardiomyopathy. Uh, it is also called a stress cardiomyopathy or broken heart syndrome. Some others call it a happy heart syndrome. It's a very interesting topic and we don't see that often, but again, we don't want to miss it. So let's explore this interesting topic called Takutsubo cardiomyopathy. With me, I have um, uh, Becky, who has got some really interesting um, um, expertise in ECG and many other aspects of MRC medicine and urgent care. So she's going to help me as well. Uh, welcome, Becky. Hello, everyone. I am Becky. As always, I am very excited to be here. Over the next few minutes, we are going to show you some awesome ECGs with a lot of animations and up-to-date information. Hope you like it. I know how amazing you are. Please press on the subscribe button below and do not forget to click on the bell icon to get regular updates. We will bring to you new exciting videos regularly for your education and entertainment. If you have any burning questions or awesome ideas, please write in the comments section below and we will get back to you as soon as we can. I can assure you that the next few minutes will be brilliant. I will be with you till the end of the video. Let's start, shall we? Yeah, so let's start uh, without wasting any time. So um, let's uh, make some signposts. Um, so over the next few minutes, uh, we'll talk about what is this Takutsubo, or what is all about, how this was named, how, um, uh, what are the different components of it. Then we'll talk about how to diagnose it, what are the things we should look for in the history, in the assessment, examination, and investigations. With regards to the investigations, we'll specifically focus on ECG. We'll talk about this uh, in details. We'll also talk about the echocardiographic features, which are very specific for Takutsubo cardiomyopathy. As a clinician, our role does not end with the diagnosis. We need to know how to manage it, whether it is in the emergency medicine, urgent care, or in the ward. We need to know uh, in, f in pretty details about the management options. All right. So let's t tell you about a case that I have seen recently. A couple of months ago, I was working in a rural urgent care center. It's a very small resource um, um, depleted, I would say. There is not much resources uh, center with a very uh, limited um, staffing level. Um, the nearest hospital is about five hours drive. And in helicopter, it takes about 45 minutes to fly as well. So I saw this 64-year-old lady who came with uh, some dull pain in the chest uh, that is mostly on the left side. It was constant in nature for the last 24 hours. Uh, it was uh, going uh, to the left arm or radiating to the left arm. It was moderate to severe in intensity. Uh, she was not in a state to come to the hospital. One of her friends is a nurse who was very concerned. So she brought her to the, to the hospital. She's otherwise fit and well, usually does not go to the hospital or to the GP, um, and she does not take any medications. One important thing is that she's a chronic smoker, and she is not going to buy the option of uh, cessation of smoking. She's in deep love with the cigarettes, and she, she is not going to stop it. When I digged into the history a little bit further, I uh, got that uh, background history that uh, her husband died three weeks ago from a heart attack, which was very sad and depressing, and I showed some empathy for that. In, on further questioning, it, uh, it revealed that um, her cat died uh, a few days ago. Actually, the cat was killed by her own dog. And her chicken was killed as well by the same dog. And then they decided that this dog is getting bonkers, so let's kill this dog as well. So, very uh, uh, close personnel, I would say, have, have died over the last three weeks. The husband died, the cat died, the, the chicken died, the dog died, and she is on, on her own at this moment. Please uh, concentrate on that particular aspect of this story. It's not made of a story, it is a real story. Um, so on examination, she was found to be a 
a little lady, cachectic, as you can imagine from a chronic smoker. She's apyrexial. Uh, her observations are pretty stable. The heart rate was around 100, but otherwise there is nothing abnormal that I could find at that moment. So we have, her pain score was 4 out of 10. So we have given some fentanyl because it is chest pain and no contraindication for aspirin. I have given some aspirin as well. And then we did a 12 lead ECG. Now uh, you can press the pause button of your computer and have a look at this ECG to find out what are the normal and what are the abnormal things. Uh, I'm pretty sure if you follow the systematic approach, you will find what they are. In the, the next few minutes, we are going to uh, discuss about this particular ECG in further details. But uh, if you can understand um, from this particular story, a patient who is coming with chest pain, who has got some abnormal ECG, who has got some history of uh, uh, emotional stress over the last three weeks, my differential diagnosis was it would be a Takutsubo. It could be acute coronary syndrome. Uh, but after looking at this ECG and also after doing the bedside echocardiogram, I was uh, of the opinion that this is Takutsubo. So let's talk about Takutsubo at first and then we'll discuss about this patient later. So what is Takutsubo? So Takutsubo is not a permanent problem. It's a transient problem. If there is stress, the patient develops Takutsubo and if you remove the stress, the heart becomes normal and Takutsubo improves. Takutsubo is a, it's a mimic of the myocardial infraction. Itself is not a myocardial infraction. It does not affect specific coronary arteries. And the treatment is a little different as well. So it is one of the um, mimic of myocardial infraction and we need to know about this topic really, really well, whether it is in a urgent care setting or in the emergency department or in the ward setting. The main diagnostic feature that I will discuss in a, in a few slides later is that if these patients have got angiogram, that becomes negative. So no specific coronary artery obstruction or plaque or uh, uh, blockage is found. The specific thing that we can find, however, is the abnormal echocardiogram. And that abnormal echocardiogram will show some wall motion abnormalities, which may be reduced uh, contraction. So there may be a bradykinesia. There may be absence of the contraction, which is the akinesia. Or there may be abnormal contraction, which is called dyskinesia. I'll show you the echocardiographic feature of my patient in a minute. So the, this is many, many authors call it Takutsubo. Uh, originally, it was named in 1990s in Japan. And this Takutsubo is a Japanese word. I'll tell you why it's called Takutsubo in a second. If you look at the medical literature, you will find that it's also called a stress cardiomyopathy. Invariably, in all patients, it is associated with some sort of stress which may be, um, uh, which may be uh, uh, physical stress, emotional stress, a negative stress like somebody died, or a positive stress that somebody is too happy. Um, some people call it apical balloon syndrome because of the echocardiographic finding, because the apex of the heart, especially the left ventricle, that, that is dilated and it looks like a balloon. It's also called broken heart syndrome because it is associated with uh, some sort of negative stress. Like in my patient, the patient's uh, husband died, the cat died, the chicken died, the dog died. So this is a negative stress that, um, that gave it a name of broken heart syndrome. Uh, there is a registry worldwide of Takutsubo. And um, there is a paper recently um, published which shows that actually not all of them are negative stress. That is about 5% of the patients who have got positive stress. So if somebody goes to a honeymoon or become too happy, they can also develop Takutsubo. So why it is called Takutsubo? So Takutsubo is a Japanese word. And it's actually, uh, what it men means is a pot, a clay pot that is used to catch octopus. So this particular pot has got some special appearance as you can see in this picture. So uh, in the, in the lower part, that is a bit dilated than in the upper part or the... Uh, and normally, you know that the heart shape is the lower part, the apex that is a bit narrow, and the base is expanded. 
But in Takutsubo, that, that is changed. So the apex becomes dilated and the base remains same. And that is why it looks like this traditional pot that is used in Japan to cast octopus or Takutsubo. That's why it's called Takutsubo cardiomyopathy. Uh, specifically. In the early days, in 1990s, when uh, Takutsubo came uh, in medical literature, it was called Takutsubo, but now different authors call it Takutsubo within bracket stress cardiomyopathy, or some people call it just a stress cardiomyopathy, not Takutsubo at all. Um, so this is what happens. So this is a normal heart on the left side. This is the right, um, right atrium here, left atrium here, right ventricle here, left ventricle here, if you look at the apex of the uh, ventricle, especially the left ventricle, it's pretty narrow, and that is classic normal heart. However, in Takutsu, what happens is, nobody knows exactly what happens, but this is the hypothesis that in the apex of the heart, there is excessive amount of catecholamine receptors, uh, beta-1, beta-2 receptors. If you are under a lot of stress, especially the negative stress, the uh, circulating level of adrenaline, noradrenaline, or in US they call it epinephrine, norepinephrine, that increases. And that can cause some amount of vasoconstriction, so microvasculature uh, uh, changes, and that decreases the blood supply to that myocardium. It causes some amount of transient ischemic event, and so if you do the troponin, that may be elevated. And because of the reduced blood supply, there may be uh, some amount of weakness in this area. That is why there is bradykinesia or akinesia. Because the uh, left ventricular pressure is high uh, during the contraction of the left ventricle, this area uh, there is dilated. And if it happens for several weeks, the body remodels itself and that may remain there for several weeks. And if we do um, an echocardiogram, it might show that the apex of the left ventricle, it looks like a takutsubo or a pot that is used to, to catch octopus. Um, interestingly, if somebody is not under stress, but for some reason, if there is increased circulating catecholamines, like in pheochromocytoma, which is a tumor in the adrenal medulla, and they secrete excessive amount of adrenaline and noradrenaline, they can have the exactly similar presentation. In uh, intensive care unit, we sometimes give uh, noradrenaline and adrenaline for many days to control their blood pressure. Um, and if we give adrenaline uh, in these patients, nor noradrenaline in that matter, they can sometimes develop the exactly similar presentation. If the patient has got intracranial hemorrhage, that can put the patient under a lot of stress, um, even if the patient's DCS is maybe three. But uh, that can cause stress and that can cause Takutsubo-like presentation. So. Uh, this is a very nice picture um, that I got from uh, a journal. Uh, I think it's from Nature, and that is really explaining what happens in Takutsubo. Um, now, this is very interesting. It's not very common, and not many clinicians are aware of it after I spoke to them. But if you see 100 patients with suspected SES and raised troponin, one or two patients out of that 100 may have Takutsubo. And that is the data, that is the research data which shows that uh, out of 100 patients who have got raised troponin, one or two patients can have Takutsubo. So God knows how many um, Takutsubo patients I have uh, misdiagnosed or failed to diagnose. But usually my I have got a very low threshold to get cardiology consult if I find a patient has got uh, suspected acute coronary syndrome or raised troponin. I don't send the patient home with raised troponin. So um, I'm pretty sure they have picked it up, although I have not followed them up. So as I mentioned, in the 1990s, uh, this Takutsubo was um, first described in Japan, and Takutsubo itself is a Japanese word. Um, but later it is found that it is found all over the world. It is not a Japanese problem or Asian problem. Um, there are certain risk factors that can help us to, um, to think about Takutsubo. These are stress. As I've said, this can be physical stress, emotional stress, it can be positive stress, negative stress. Females have got higher risk of development of Takutsubo. About four out of five patients with Takutsubo are females. Usually this is found in elderly patients, more than 60. I would not call uh, patients more than 60 elderly, but yeah, I mean, I, I would say um, 
advanced age or more experienced people, more than 60 years, they have got Takutsubo. Genetic predisposition still n uh, now, mostly it is found in Asian, but um, especially in Japanese, but it can happen to anybody. And the problem with this uh, particular condition is that we cannot use our uh, standard risk stratification tools like uh, Timmy score, EDAC score, heart score. Um, so those are the scoring system that is utilized for the acute coronary syndrome, but Takutsubo was not included in the um, in the research of those type of uh, risk stratification tools. So this is a completely different paradigm. This is a completely different territory. So if we suspect Takutsubo, please don't use those type of uh, risk stratification tools because those are, those are not tailored for uh, Takutsubo at all. So what happens? We have already talked about it. Nobody knows how Takutsubo happens, right? Um, there is conflicting evidence. Different researchers found different things. However, um, the main thing that uh, we talk about is that there is some stress and there is probably something to do with the circulating catecholamines. Um, the, these patients have got a circulating level of catecholamine and nor, nor, or epinephrine or norepinephrine, they are elevated. And as we have mentioned, for some reason, if you give excessive catecholamines, for example, if a patient is in ICU and they need uh, vasopressure support or inotropic support, if you give noradrenaline no, or adrenaline or both, they have got higher risk. A few chromocytoma who are not under stress or maybe not under stress, they have got circulating level of increased catecholamines uh, and that can cause Takusu as well. Well, I have to be very honest here. Yep. There is no well-proven mechanism for Takotsubo. Absolutely. There are quite a few hypotheses though. The most common hypothesis is that of catecholamine excess. Blood levels of both epinephrine and norepinephrine were much higher among the patients with Takotsubo than other myocardial infarction patients. True. It is thought that the excess catecholamines cause microvascular spasm which results in myocardial stunning. Mm. Direct catecholamine induced myocardial toxicity is also a possibility. This hypothesis is well supported by the fact that administration of supra-therapeutic dose of catecholamines such as epinephrine or norepinephrine aggravates the stress cardiomyopathy. Yep. Even normal dose of dobutamine can cause the same issue. Ooh. Interestingly, the patients with pheochromocytoma have similar reversible cardiomyopathy just like Takotsubo, supporting the catecholamine excess hypothesis. Excellent. So that is the so nobody knows how this happens. But these are the various hypotheses, and there is credible explanation for this. So how do the patient present to the uh, emergency department or urgent care or other facilities? Usually, uh, there may be um, some amount of stress. I am emphasizing it may be. So there may be some stress. We may not find it. Um, so the commonest is if somebody dies, somebody you, you care for, somebody you... Um, somebody, some, someone near or dear one. It may be a cat, it may be a dog, it may be a chicken, but it may be a human, human being as well. There may be some domestic abuse and it's uh, stunning to know how many times we actually don't think about it. Um, arguments. Um, so I tell some of my colleagues in the emergency department, um, uh, sometimes um, we, we, f we struggle to um, refer the patients to the inpatient wards and th that can lead to various types of arguments and various types of stress. So I'm not sure, there is no data, but God knows um, how many of the clinicians in the emergency department or urgent care uh, develop Takutsubo from there. If there is some catastrophic medical diagnosis like a terminal cancer, that can cause this. Financial loss. Similarly, if somebody wins a million dollar lottery, that can give positive stress. That can lead to Takotsubo as well. In uh, Christchurch, there was an earthquake uh, about 10 years ago, and um, many people developed Takotsubo. And there is some paper from, I think it was, uh, it was from the team of Dr. Smythe, who is a cardiologist here in uh, Christchurch. Um, and that shows that there is um, actually a uh, lot of patients develop uh, Takotsubo or stress cardiomyopathy from the stress of the earthquake or natu natural disaster. If there is some acute uh, medical illness, for example, intracranial hemorrhage, that can give rise to Takotsubo as well. Um, 
the patient usually presents with chest pain and it's very difficult to differentiate uh, a patient with acute coronary syndrome chest pain and Takutsubo chest pain because they are the same. Exactly similar presentation, dull chest pain, may have some radiation with the arm, jaw, neck. Um, but again, remember that there are about 20% or 24% of the patients, they may not have any chest pain. They can have some other features like shortness of breath or they can have a syncope. They can have cardiogenic shock or even a cardiac arrest uh, even the VTVF. Remember that this can affect any patient, even the young patient coming with chest pain. We need to take the history and examine them and work them up thoroughly because some of them may have Takutsubo from the stress that they are going through. Young patients with syncope, we look for the classic features like the Brugada syndrome, we look for Olpertson White syndrome, prolonged QTC, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia this sort of things. But remember that Takutsubo can also give rise to syncope events, even if it is a young patient. So my take home point here is what the mind does not know, the eyes cannot see. So we need to know about it, keep it in mind that the patient can have Takutsubo even if the patient is young. The main ECG features is the ST elevation in about uh, less than half of the patients can have ST elevation. They can have some ST depression, a very minority of patients. TOA inversion, I don't have the data with me how many patients, but in my patient, if you can remember the ECG that I have shown you a few minutes earlier, that is widespread TOA inversion. And that is a feature of uh, Takutsubo as well. In my patient, there was prolonged QTC. So that is another feature that we should look for. There may be some abnormal Q waves um, from the long-standing uh, morphological abnormality in the heart and patient can have sinus tachycardia. In my patient, there was some sinus tachycardia initially, but after we gave some painkillers, aspirin, gradually the pain set, uh, settled down and the heart rate has come down uh, to normal level as well. Um, one of the things that is interesting is that many patients have got raised troponin and that can be very high almost eight times upper normal limit of uh, troponin. The creatinine kinase can be elevated um, and also the BNP can be elevated, which means that the patient has got a higher risk of heart failure as well. In this context, let's talk about the specific uh, diagnostic criteria called this myoclinic criteria. There are four things that we need to look for. We already talked about it, but let's recap. So the first thing is, if we do the echocardiogram, it will show some left ventricular uh, dysfunction. So for example, there may be hypokinesia, akinesia, or bradykinesia. So either reduced contraction, absence of the contraction, or abnormal contraction. It usually is in the apex in 80% of the cases, but in the rest of the cases, it can be in the mid ventricle, in the base, global, or biventricular. The next thing is if the patient goes to the cath lab and had angiogram, it is negative. If we do the ECG, that is abnormal, and in my patient I have shown you, that is widespread TOA inversion, prolonged QTC. Even if this is uh, normal, they can have raised troponin, and in my patient the troponin was elevated. And the most important thing is, we need to work up for other pathologies like myocarditis or pheochromocytoma. They should be absent. If the pheochromocytoma or myocarditis is present, this is not Takutsubo. This is pheochromocytoma or myocarditis. Once we exclude them, then we can say this is Takutsubo. So you can see that there is a bit of uh, problem. So in the emergency department or urgent care, we cannot say for sure this patient has got Takutsubo or does not have Takutsubo until or unless we do the formal echocardiogram, angiogram, and rule out pheochromocytoma and myocarditis. So let's talk about the bedside, uh, the formal echocardiogram. We have already talked about it. So the main things are the patient can have wall motion abnormalities, for example, bradykinesia, akinesia, or dyskinesia. About 80% of the patients, these abnormalities are found in the apex of the left ventricle, but it can be mid ventricular, it can be basal, it can be focal, it can be global, which, which are rare. Ejection fraction is reduced, and that can affect our management. Um, and then uh, in about one third of the patients, it can be biventricular. So let me show you the echocardiogram of my patient. Uh, if you are already familiar with echocardiogram, you know what I mean, but if you are not, let me introduce you to this echocardiogram. 
So this particular view was obtained at the apex of the heart. We call this um, the A4C, that is the apical fourth chamber view. So these are the four chambers here. So this is the right atrium here, and this is the right ventricle here. The left atrium is here, and the left ventricle is here. If you carefully look at it, the right ventricle that is contracting very well, it's almost like uh, the walls are uh, touching each other. So that's good, so that is good contraction. But if you compare uh, with the uh, left ventricle, the especially the apex is not contracting that much. So there is some bradykinesia or hypokinesia in the apex. But if you look at the base, the, that is contracting very well, and that is very well demonstrated. So if you call it apical balloon syndrome, uh, that is well justified here. Um, th there is a some th there is a, a portion of the aortic valve here. So let me summarize it: the echocardiographic finding from the apical four chamber view. I find that the, there is dilatation of the apex of the left ventricle here, and also there is not enough contraction in the left ventricular apex in comparison to the rest of the heart. So we call it the hypokinesia or bradykinesia in the apex of the left ventricle. Uh, these are the two features which actually point us to the diagnosis of um, Takutsubo or stress cardiomyopathy or uh, you can call it a broken heart syndrome. So if you can get uh, this view then usually that is good enough to guide you to the diagnosis. This is not a formal echocardiogram, we need a formal echocardiogram but this is enough to think about um, a Takutsubo. So usually in case of echocardiogram it says that one view is not good enough ideally there should be at least five or six different views like the uh, short axis uh, uh, short axis uh, parasternal short axis view parasternal long axis view apical four chamber view apical five chamber view and a subgeophoid view sometimes we do suprasternal view as well so we have done the subgeophoid view and that is um, here um, again, let me uh, introduce to you these various components if you are not familiar with it. So this is the right atrium and this is the right ventricle. This is the left atrium here and the left ventricle is here. This is the tricuspid valve and this is the mitral valve here and this is the aortic valve in some of uh, the component. If you carefully look at it just like the previous uh, four, uh, apical four chamber view, there is good contraction of the right ventricle and also in right atrium and it is very active. Um, however, if you compare the left ventricle, especially apex, it's not a very good view, I'll have to say, but still you can see that there is some dilatation in the uh, left uh, ventricle and it's not contracting very well. It is not akinesia, there is some contraction, so this is hypokinesia or bradykinesia, but it's not completely absent. It may be because this is too early stage of diagnosis. So if you can get at least these two views, then that is good enough to diagnose it. I don't have good uh, parasternal long axis or short axis views. Um, I have got in uh, some other patient, but uh, I'll do a different video uh, with these various views in case of Takul Subo. All right, so what about ECG? As you know that we go through the ECG in a very systematic way and let's uh, focus on that. So. If you are not already familiar with it, uh, this is my little diagram about the heart. This is the right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle here, left ventricle here. The SA node is here, AV node is here. The EOLO components, these are the conduction system. SA node is a pacemaker. It produces cardiac impulse. So uh, Becky has got some very good um, systematic approach in interpretation of the ECGs and she's going to talk us through the uh, uh, systematic approach. All right, Becky, after you. This is the normal cardiac activity. The SA node is the pacemaker of the heart. It generates cardiac impulse at the normal rate of 60 to 90 beats per minute. The cardiac impulse then passes through the interatrial pathways to the AV node where there is some delay. You can appreciate it here. In the ECG, there is a PR interval due to the AV nodal delay. This is followed by the conduction of cardiac impulse through the bundle of his into the right and left bundles and Purkinje fibers and cardiac myocytes. In the ECG, the P wave represents the atrial depolarization, the PR interval is the AV nodal delay, the QRS complex is the ventricular depolarization and the T wave is the ventricular repolarization. 
This goes on and on and on. So, the normal ECG is very easy to comprehend. One thing needs to be remembered is that the positive deflection of the ECG means that the cardiac impulse is passing towards the lead. On the other hand, a negative deflection means that the cardiac impulse is passing away from the particular lead. Excellent stuff, isn't it? Yes, this is really good, really good. So, thank you very much. Um, let's go through the systematic approach of looking at the ECG. So, every time I look at the ECG or my trainees uh, look at the ECG, I ask them to go through this in the same way. Uh, I use this little watch and it takes about 20 to 30 seconds to uh, interpret the ECG. So, let's uh, do this once again. So, first of all, make sure this is the right patient, then look at the rate. There are two types of rates, atrial rate and ventricular rate. If there is a sinus rhythm, the atrial rate and ventricular rate, they will be similar. However, if there is some uh, hard blocks, uh, the rate can be different. So calculate it in a, in a very systematic way. Uh, once you are happy with the rate, then look at uh, the uh, rhythm. Is it sinus rhythm? Is it regular? Is it irregular? Is it um, bundle branch block? Is it first degree, second degree, third degree block? Or something else going on? Once you are happy with the rate and the rhythm, look at the axis. It's easy to look at the axis. Look at the lead one and AVF, and that will give you some rough idea about axis. Uh, is it right axis deviation, which is abnormal? A left axis deviation, normal axis, or northwest axis? We have discussed this in a different video. We'll go through this in a different video um, later. Then look at the PR intervals and PR segment. They are not the same. Please don't get confused between these two. A gold mine in the ECG is the QRS complex. Go through them in a systematic way. Um, and then you look at um, the ST segment and the T waves. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that will give you uh, a lot of information to help you with the diagnosis of the ECG. Once you're happy with that, then go for QT interval or Q corrected QT interval or corrected for the rate. Um, and then you look at the other fine prints like AVR, uh, the uh, Brugada, uh, the, Br um, the uh, different criteria like Scarborough criteria. Once you get all the information, correlate the ECG features with the patient. And that is what we call synthesis. Uh, think about the diagnosis, think about the management options, risk stratification, management, complications, these sort of things. So, every time you look at the ECG, please go through it in a systematic way. Look at the rate, rhythm, axis, PR intervals, QRS complex, ST segment, T waves, QTC, AVR, and the fine prints such as our wave progression, Scabosa criteria, pacing spikes, left ventricular hypertrophy, etc. Easy PC. If you go through these steps every time, you will not ever miss the important information. Hope that helps. That's very helpful. So let's uh, go through the ECG of my patient. So this is the patient we have seen. We have talked about the 64-year-old lady whose husband died three weeks ago. Cat died, dog died, chicken died, and she's coming with chest pain. And this is the ECG. Uh, Becky, please go through this ECG in a systematic way. Thank you. It is a fantastic ECG, Avijith. Thank you. I am going to interpret this ECG in a very systematic way. However, if there is an elephant in the room, that does not need an introduction. The elephant in the room in this ECG is widespread T-wave inversions. I will come back to it in a second. Let me talk you through the usual stuff at first. In this 12 lead ECG, the ventricular rate is about 90 beats per minute. Yep. Every QRS complex is preceded by a P wave. Yep. There is a happy marriage between the P waves and the QRS complexes. Yep. Therefore, the rhythm is sinus rhythm. The axis of the QRS complexes is left axis deviation or left anterior fascicular block. The P wave is normal in morphology. The PR interval is constant. The ST segment is mostly isoelectric. The T wave inversions in leads 1, 2, AVL, V2 to V6. I am particularly concerned about the deep T wave inversion in V4 to V6 leads. The QTC is about 480 milliseconds which is prolonged. The AVR lead is not looking suspicious to me. To compile all these information together along with the clinical features, I am of the impression that the patient has attack at subocardiomyopathy. I am really very concerned about this patient. My immediate action would be to seek and treat the underlying cause. 
My priority is to treat the patient as a non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction or non-STEMI. For example, aspirin 300 mg orally, clopidogrel 300 mg orally, IV fentanyl 10 to 30 mg stat and urgent cardiology consult for a formal echo and activation of cath lab. This is an unusual ECG that every emergency medicine doctor should be familiar with. Really impressive findings. Hope the patient is doing all right. Yeah, so um, thank you very much. Um, so a couple of things here is that um, uh, you're absolutely right that there is a widespread TOA inversion, there is sinus rhythm, there is left axis deviation, and there is uh, the TOA inversion in V4, V5, V6 that is really, really very prominent. And sometimes uh, the uh, TOA inversion is so big that whole of the QRS complex can be um, buried into the T wave. It's, 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 it's really big. Um, yeah, so Takutsubo is uh, in the top priority of the diagnosis of this patient. One thing is that the QT interval, sometimes it can be difficult to detect the QT interval from a 12 DCG. Uh, one of the simple way of doing it is uh, if we look at the QT interval from beginning of Q QRS complex to the end of the T wave, and um, if that is less than 50% of the RR interval, that usually is uh, prolonged. And that is exactly what has happened to this particular patient. Thank you once again. Now what to do about it? The most important thing is find out the cause and the cause is the stress. So if we can, um, if we, if we can do the resolution of the physical or emotional stress, uh, then uh, most of the problems are solved. The specific management depends on what type of problems they develop. As you have said, angiogram will be negative, so we cannot do stenting. However, patient can develop heart failure, they can develop cardiogenic shock, and that is something needs, we need to treat it. And that is in the territory of um, the cardiologist, uh, the ED, ICU. Um, and this position is invariably every patient needs a cardiology consult. They need admission for ECG, echocardiogram, and angiogram. So let's talk about the supportive management or supportive treatment. Uh, these patients have got some chest pain, so I will give some uh, analysis here, such as fentanyl. 10 to 30 microgram IV if there is no contraindication, uh, making sure the patient is immunogenically stable. We can give some emotional support, and that in that case, we might need help with uh, the mental health team sometimes. Um, we need to give some anticoagulant because uh, these patients have got um, some higher risk of the intraventricular uh, thrombus formation. In real life, I would give aspirin 300 milligram, I'll give clopidogrel or ticagrelor, I'll give some clexin, one milligram per kg subcut, and I'll, give, I'll consult the cardiology uh, for echocardiogram and angiogram. In about five to 10 percent of the patients, they can develop complications like cardiogenic shock. That's the importance of the um, diagnosis of this condition. If we fail to diagnose um, the um, uh, Takutsubo, they can develop uh, cardiogenic shock, and that is not a small number. One in every 10 patients can develop cardiogenic shock. Two types of scenarios can develop. One is that there may not be any left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. These are the patients where we can give some fluid, but with caution. So don't give one liter of normal saline. You can give maybe 250 ml of normal saline to keep the blood pressure within uh, range. Um, we can also give some IV dobutamine or dopamine as a temporizing measure to control uh, their blood pressure. In persistent hypotension, we can give some vasopressure uh, support like uh, noradrenaline or metadaminol or even phenylef uh, phenylephrine. If there is marked left ventricular dysfunction, then invasive procedures such as intra-aortic balloon pump may be, uh, may be inserted. The other scenario is that they can have left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and cardiogenic shock. We should not give any inotropic support. Um, that will make the thing worse. Instead, we can give some beta blocker, like some metoprolol or bisoprolol. We can elevate the uh, leg. That will increase the venous return. Uh, we can also give some IV fluid resuscitation with caution because they can develop pulmonary congestion. IV phenylephrine infusion, if all this fails, and if everything fails, invasive procedure, that is intraortic balloon pump, can be inserted. Some of the patients can develop heart failure, and the management is similar like other heart failure patients. So give oxygen, 15 liters with a non-rebreathing uh, bag, 
aim for a saturation of more than 92 percent. We can give a CPAP as a non-invasive ventilation, 10 centimeter of water pressure. Um, we can give some vasodilator if the blood pressure is stable. We can give GTN infusion, um, 3 to 30 microgram per minute. We can give diuretics such as uh, IV frisamide. We can give 40 to 80 milligram. So okay, guys, it's time to wrap up now. Yep. Tachycardia cardiomyopathy is a syndrome characterized by transient regional left ventricular dysfunction in the absence of significant coronary artery disease. The postulated pathogenic mechanisms include number one catecholamine excess, number two microvascular dysfunction, and number three multivessel coronary artery spasm. The diagnosis of stress cardiomyopathy should be suspected in adults who present with a suspected acute coronary syndrome particularly when the clinical manifestations and electrocardiographic abnormalities are out of proportion to the degree of elevation in cardiac biomarkers. A physical or emotional trigger is often but not always present. Diagnostic criteria include number one presence of transient regional wall motion abnormalities, typically not in a single coronary distribution. Number two absence of angiographic evidence of obstructive coronary disease or acute plaque rupture. Number three presence of new electrocardiographic abnormalities or modest troponin elevation and number four absence of pheochromocytoma or myocarditis. These four features are called the Mayo Clinic Diagnostic Criteria for Takotsubo. In patients who present with a clinical picture consistent with ACS, the clinical suspicion of possible stress cardiomyopathy should not alter evaluation and management of these ACS conditions. The significant majority of these cases are due to occlusion of a coronary artery. Therefore, revascularization therapy should not be delayed in these patients. Wall motion abnormalities in patients with stress cardiomyopathy are typically detected by echocardiography or left ventriculography. The differential diagnosis of stress cardiomyopathy includes ACS, cocaine-related ACS, multivessel coronary artery spasm, myocarditis, and pheochromocytoma. Excellent summary. Um, let's uh, make the summary of the summary. So in the very first slide, we have talked about uh, the uh, presentation, and I think we have achieved those goals. We talked about what is Takutsubo, and um, so Takutsubo is the stress cardiomyopathy, and the name Takutsubo is coming from that uh, classic pot that is used in Japan to catch octopus. The, the, the apex of the heart gets dilated, which looks like that particular pot. That is why it's called Takutsubo. We talked about how to diagnose Takutsubo from the history, from the clinical presentation, some investigations like the ECG and echocardiogram, troponin. Invariably, all these patients need um, admission to cardiology for further investigation like angiogram, echo formal echocardiogram. We talked about the management. So in the ED or urgent care, management is with uh, the usual non stemi patient. So make sure that if the patient is young, don't send the patient home just because um, uh, there is abnormal ECG but uh, patient is young, don't, don't send the patient home. These patients need admission to cardiology. So the main thing is the history taking. If there is some stress, chest pain, shortness of breath, syncope, think about Takutsubo. It may not be the diagnosis because it's not very common, but again, we don't want to miss it. So these are the four big boxes in this presentation, and I hope that you find it useful. Um, the main papers that I used um, are uh, the papers from Aviram Prasad, uh, which is in up to date. If you have got access, please go through this. This is really in-depth uh, paper. Uh, that shows about uh, the diagnosis and management of Takutsubo. There are some very interesting uh, paper. Uh, there was one paper that was published uh, f uh, by Gadri uh, that uh, I, have I mentioned about it, that um, there is something called happy heart syndrome. So about 5 to 6 percent of the patients who have got Takutsubo, according to the Takutsubo um, uh, worldwide um, um, database, um, they I found that this is not associated with negative stress. This is associated with positive stress. So if the patient is too happy, they can also develop Takutsubo. So there are some more references. Please go through them. If you have any questions, please uh, get in touch, and I'm happy to answer to your questions. All right. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, for your time. I hope you find it useful. Um, any questions, please ask. Okay, folks. Thank you for watching the video. 
Hope you have enjoyed the video. You are so awesome. If you find it useful, please like the video, subscribe to the channel and share it with others. Please write comments below the video. For every comment that you write, positive or negative, I will personally give a cookie to my cat Lucy. I promise I will do. If you have any burning questions, constructive suggestions or some awesome ideas, please get in touch. We would love to hear from you. Your comments and suggestions are very important to us. You can contact us through email, Twitter or Dr. Barai's webpage. Thanks once again. See you soon. Bye for now. Thanks, um, uh, Becky, for all your help. Thank you, everyone.